Hey everybody, my name is Celine Coggins. I am the Executive Director of Grant Makers for Education. We're just gonna let the room fill for a minute and then get underway. All righty. I can tell that the room is already filling really quickly. Um, we have a really fantastic turnout today. And so I wanna welcome you to our session on asset-based communications. I wanna start by saying uh, this is a fast moving conversation. We're not gonna be done at the end of the conversation. We are not going to be perfect in this conversation, uh, but we're going to try to make our learning transparent. So the conversation was an outgrowth uh, that, of a conversation that I had with Cindy Williams, who many of you might know as the uh, former head of communications at the Gates Foundation. Uh, you know, we had a conversation about much of the language that we used over the past kind of decades in our career um, and how it is often alienated and how we can learn. And so, you know, Cindy's been doing it, this for her whole life. I, um, I've written a whole bunch of books and I'm sure if I looked through those books, there are ways that I might reframe what I had said. Uh, so this is, so Cindy agreed to make transparent a conversation she's been having with two mentors of hers and, uh, you know, just as a means of having all of us learn. So this is a conversation that we invite you to, uh, you know, post questions in the chat. Uh, Cindy's going to mostly do it kind of interview style and they're going to talk about what they've learned uh, along the way on their journey. And so Cindy, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you, Celine. And Celine, thank you for making the space for this conversation. We're all on this journey of becoming anti-racist as foundations and as individuals. We're doing the hard work of self-reflection and shifting mindsets. But then there's the need to actually change, to show up differently in the world. And I think, and I know you do too, that part of showing up differently in the world is shifting our language. Uh, for the past year, I've had this stack of books by my bed how to be an anti-racist, Black Fatigue, Jess Schools, Trisha's book, This is the Work. Uh, and the more I read, the more humbled I am by my lack of knowledge and the sensitivity as a white woman of privilege and the less confident actually I've become in my ability to say the right thing. Um, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, I have 10,000 hours in deficit-based language. Mm -hmm. So I'm eager to change and I'm eager to change alongside you guys today. I mean, going back to the days of No Child Left Behind, my vocabulary has been sort of replete with words like subgroups and achievement gaps and minorities and at risk. And these words have been a part of my workplace taxonomy, but even more egregious than my words really has been my tone and my frame and my approach. And so I know I'm not alone in this journey. And today we have two amazing experts with us um, that I am so excited to introduce to you. Both of them are advancing social justice and their work every day in public education systems. They've personally inspired me. Um, they're wicked smart, they're fearless, and they're coming to this conversation with a dose of serious honesty because they realize and they understand the important role that you guys play in the philanthropic sector in advancing justice. And so I just wanna take a moment to introduce our two panelists and then I'm gonna ask them to tell us a little bit about their story. So Malia LaCour is the founder and executive director of Becoming Justice. It's an organization that's laser focused on educational equity. Her days are spent collaborating with organizations and nonprofits like yours who are serious about transformational leadership and systemic change. She facilitates hard conversations and reflections that lead to healing and alignment of hearts. Her goal is to create racially liberated systems. My favorite thing I've heard her say is that we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, which is hard to do. Um, she was also the Executive Director of Equity and Education at the Puget Sound Educational Services District, or the ESD. She led their efforts to become an anti-racist, multicultural organization, as well as their Equity and Education Department, which provided consultation in PD and system change support to over 20 school districts, community colleges, charter schools uh, here in Washington State. Somehow she's also finding time to be a columnist for the South Seattle Emerald, where she's talking about racial healing in South Seattle, and you guys know our state has had a, a hard go. Um, I also want to introduce Trish, Trish Milanes de Zico, uh, who similarly has made her career in social justice and made kids for life's work. Um, many of you may know her. She's the co-founder and executive director of the Technology Access Foundation. We call it TAF. And she oversees the highest performing schools in the state of Washington, serving black and brown students a 99% on time graduation rate 
and 100% college acceptance rate. And I absolutely love to brag on her. But I think more important is the environment she's creating for kids, kids to thrive. And her kids are confident and they know they can change the world. They create and build really cool stuff. And I'm just excited for you to hear more about her work. Um, Trish has an, an inspiring story herself. She started Taft after rising in the ranks of Microsoft as one of the only people of color in the early days. She was one of the early Microsoft millionaires. And she invested those dollars in helping other kids like her learn to be successful in STEM. But what started as an after-school program has become a transformation model. And now she partners with districts in our state to change cultures. She's also leading the National Charter Collaborative's work to support Black leaders of color. And she lives with her spouse, Chill, where they're raising four kids. Um, now that's a mouthful, but I just think it's important they don't brag on themselves. So I just wanted you to know a little bit more about them. But I'd love to just throw it to Trish and Malia real quick to just say what brought you to this work. And uh, Malia, if you wouldn't mind starting. Sure. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, um, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, I am, I always say I've been called to this work. It is my life's work. Um, as a black mixed race woman um, growing up in predominantly white neighborhoods, um, racism was something that I experienced on a regular basis, um, both within my family and greater family and my neighborhoods and especially at school. Um, and so for me, growing up in that environment and then and really not being exposed to any conversations around race or systemic racism, no context for which to understand my own identity until I went to graduate school, when all of that, when I finally had access to that information, really just helped me not only understand myself, my own internalized racism, my own struggles, um, both within my family and in my schools, um, but it also um, inspired me to, to make change. So I left my graduate school MSW program saying, you know, I know it's 2000 and there, there are no director and equity jobs at this time, but somehow, some way that's going to be me. Um, so it's always been in my heart um, since I was young and I am so honored to be here um, in this conversation and to be working, especially with, with Trish and Cindy. So thanks. Thanks, Malia. Trish? Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're at. Um, I came to this work from my own experience in the tech sector as a programmer who graduated in 19, college in 1979. You can imagine there weren't many women of color or many people of color in the field. And as I work my way from the East Coast in Jersey, where I'm from, to Philadelphia, Tucson, San Francisco, and then eventually up to Seattle. Um, I worked for a number of companies and the thing that wasn't different is that there was still a dearth of people of color in the field. So while I was at Microsoft, I felt like um, I had an opportunity to change that. And I actually changed my career and moved to the diversity department where one of my roles was to run the high school internship program. And we structured it in a way that it was just for students of color. And of course, since they were only high schoolers, we were hiring for potential. And that's kind of where the light bulb went on for me is that the tech industry wasn't going to change um, because everything was, was great at that time, right? The, the internet was happening and uh, companies were sprouting up all over the place. And in their mind, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So I knew though that we needed to have more people of color uh, in this field and that kids who look like me had to have a better opportunity. So um, basically came to the conclusion that in order to change this, we had to change the pipeline. So that's why I left the industry to start TAF. And um, Cindy mentioned that, you know, we started in after school programs. Uh, the thing that, because I didn't have kids of my own at that time, I thought really like everybody else is just simply just add some additional programs for kids when they're out of school and everything will be all right and realize very quickly that that's not the case and um, pivoted TAF along with um, our great leadership team that we had at the time to focus on partnering with public schools because you have to change it within the system um, to help create schools that work for every kid. So I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to get the conversation going. Thank you, Trish. Mm -hmm. So you guys will see, we have a sort of slightly ambitious uh, goal for today. There's a ton of expertise on this call, not just 
Malia and Trish. So the three of us have developed some questions for you. My colleague Jess will be putting those into the chat over the course of the conversation. So you'll see her pop up. And I would just ask that you would also add your questions so that we can add those into the conversation to make sure that this time is really well spent for you. So we have broken down this idea of taxonomy into four parts for today. Uh, adjectives and labels, what words should we consider transitioning in our vocabulary? Grant making speak is replete with deficit based words that have become our normal. So how do we sort of rethink that? Tone and frame in an attempt to be succinct. You know, many of the concepts or terms we use to simplify our complex issues can unintentionally offend. So do we need to maybe embrace the idea of more words? You know, put these put the sound bites behind us during during this time. So be something that we discuss associations. You know, we tend to create word chains, word chains, word trains, sorry. We connect income level with race, with achievement gap statistics in an effort to make a point and we inevitably can contribute to stereotypes. And then identifying race and ethnicity, sort of how do we approach the constantly evolving monikers to identify race, whether that be BIPOC or black and brown or Latinx or global majority. Um, so to begin this conversation, we're gonna hear from the guru. Many of you have probably heard from Travian Shorter. He uh, is sort of coined the phrase asset framing, but what you may not know is that he's one of us. He was the vice president of the John S. and Jane Zell Knight Foundation. So Jesse, if you wouldn't mind cueing that video. Asset framing is about not defining people by their challenge, right? So once you recognize that I aspire to be a scientist or a leader, or maybe I just aspire to graduate high school, you know, like I have a goal to be a student, right? Whatever that aspiration is, if you acknowledge that aspiration before you uh, go into my various challenges, you're telling a truer story about me, right? I don't run around believing I'm an at-risk this or a low-income that or a high poverty, high crime. Like, no one carries around those labels thinking that's how I'm going to face the world, right? What people think about is, I want to maybe go to school. I want to maybe someday own a home. I want to maybe possibly get out of this neighborhood or come back to this neighborhood and build. Whatever that person's aspiration is, if you haven't bothered to acknowledge that aspiration before you engage them, then you've made them an object in the sentence. They are a thing to be dealt with, to be moved, to be manipulated. They are not a person. And once you start to engage people as, as obstacles, once you start engaging people as problems, then recognize that you've now become the problem, right? So Trish, I want to just start with you, sort of, you know, how, how does that resonate with you? Well, you know, we, we live and breathe this every day uh, in our work. And um, when I hear that, when our students hear that, when um, our teachers, our families, our parents hear that their kids are a problem, um, it's really a challenge. And so we spend a lot of time working on creating environments where kids have voice and choice, where they know they have the power, um, but we're combating against um, media and, um, and uh, other folks who are, are in grantors who are using this kind of language. And kids hear this. It's not just among the grant application, right? When, when people advertise and they talk about all the funding that they're doing, kids hear that. And it's, it's really, um, it's demoralizing, honestly, to, to hear that you're a failure, that um, somehow just by who you are and where you live and where you come from, there are other people who are making judgments on what your potential is. I think it's, it's important for those of us who've worked inside foundations to just realize that taxonomy or shorthand inside our organization you know, it becomes external messaging pretty quickly because we're in positions of power, right? People are modeling our communications and our behavior. And so I do think um, there's a new rigor that's gonna be required around our word choice as we develop this new consciousness. And, you know, Malia, how, I'd love to just hear a little bit from you about how do we start to create internal rigor around word choice? Yeah, I, I mean, I love that question because as, as Trish said, it's demoralizing language. And so in order to have internal rigor, we have to go inside first and ask ourselves the tough questions. So what are the thoughts that I'm having about our students, our BIPOC students? Um, are they dehumanizing thoughts? Are they objectifying thoughts? I mean, I think Trabian said that, that there's 
that um, our students feel objectified and demoralized. Um, so it's, it's checking, it's being mindful, honestly, of our thoughts and how, um, when I think about where we've grown up around uh, white supremacy, that that has been internalized in ways that we can't even see um, within our actions, within our words. And so it's going inside and asking ourselves, am I operating from deficit thinking? Am I, opposite, op, am I um, operating from a dehumanizing place? Um, and then interrupting that. And that starts with the personal work. No one can do that for us, but that's the internal mindfulness work we need to do in order to have that internal, internal rigor so that it shows up in our word choice. We're using life-giving words. Thank you. And you know, we, you may have seen, we just threw that question into the chat. So we'd love to sort of hear from you guys as well, you know, how you would approach that. Um, on this next slide, you're going to see a big word that I'm trying to learn how to pronounce. Hegemony, I think is how you say it uh, correctly. But I would love to just, for those of you uh, who are maybe watching on a phone, I'm just going to read this brief quote because it's the last piece we want to put forward to sort of set the context for today before we dive into the actual work. So the quote says, elites not only rule through informal consent, incentives, or even the use of force, but rather often through taken for granted accepted social conventions or practices that define and constitute what is natural, normal, and the quote way things are or should be. Hegemony then preconditions a social discourse that allows the powerful and those who use the discourse to blame outsiders and subordinates for their own oppressions and failings. It can also lead to those groups blaming themselves for their fates. This is a big word that represents a really big idea, which all of us know. But Malia, I just would love to know from your standpoint, how does this theory or construct play out in the trainings that you conduct in school districts and with leaders? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime we start to interrogate what it means to be white in this country and the privileges and the power that comes with that, um, there is, of course, a feeling of tension and deflection and defensiveness. And I think that is, that is the way hegemony plays out, right? That I, through a training, I'm going to call what's often invisible to many white people um, is this notion, this real reality of, of white privilege um, and white supremacy. And when you call that out, people start to push back because it's, it's touching on a Ooh, this is this is my this has been the natural way I've moved through the world, and now you're telling me that that there's something wrong with that, that that's not okay, that we're sort of turning their thoughts and their experiences upside down, um, and so I think anytime we're pushing against what people, especially white people, have accepted as the truth and, and reality, and start to to poke holes at that. Um, is, is how hegemony plays out. Mm -hmm. And then words, of course, too, when we ask people to look at, to look at policy um, for the ways in which it reinforces racism, and you get those, those responses like, well, that's the way we've always done it. You know, why would we change it? Well, of course we're changing it because it's leading to disparate outcomes. It's a racist policy. And yet getting people to move past that is how I think hegemony is playing out. So Trish, I know you've been on the receiving side of this sort of dominant perspective, but are you starting to see some shifts? I mean, there is a new level of consciousness in the United States. People are really leaning into this work. So have you seen anything encouraging? Um, you know, people are leaning in and they're reading. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave it right there. <laughs> really, the thing for me is reading is not enough. Getting in book groups, sitting around talking about it, that is pretty much a good example of white supremacist, cult supremacist culture in how uh, work is absorbed and started. Um, for us, on the other side of this, it's I want to know when is action going to happen? When are you going to hit the uncomfortable moments and start to push? Um, when I think about um, this work in, in public schools, our schools are working the way they were designed to work. It's just how it is. What are we going to do to change that so that it works for every single student, regardless of race, ability, English language, um, 
income regardless of race, right? When do we fix that? And that's what that says to me. Um, and, and even though, um, you know, grantors are not in the public education system, they are shaping it by the way they grant and the language that they use. Well, and I think we see an acknowledgement of that just by the number of people who've come to this conversation today. Mm -hmm. I think that that we all know we need to, to do and know more and get a lot more action oriented in it. Um, I do want to ground our conversation today in just a couple of key definitions. And I know we've all heard them before, but I think to have the same conversation, we need to just maybe spend a few minutes looking at them. And so, Malia, I know you do this as a part of your workshops, but would you just walk through these three important theories and concepts for us as we get ready to talk about asset versus deficit? Absolutely. And I just want to just, again, just underscore, I so appreciate what Trish said about people are reading, you know, um, I've, I've this, this notion of we are not a theory keeps coming to mind because people are reading and to her point, not taking action, but then sharing these theories with Black, Indigenous, and people of color as if we don't know our own reality <laughs> and our own experience. And that is, um, it's heartbreaking and it's also just, it's also dehumanizing. And so I feel it's really important to say that because I'm about to launch into some important definitions that I think that, that we all need to, to keep in mind. Um, and I also don't want people to use this to continue theorizing in such a way that keeps us spinning in the intellectual and not into the actual change that needs to happen. Um, so I know I, I, I'll have you all read this silently to yourself, but just wanna do a couple highlights that of course, white supremacy is um, not often talked about in the correct way, I'll say, in this, in this country. Um, it's often, um, people often think of the KKK. Um, white supremacy is actually a historically based, institutionally perpetuated ideology, right? It shows up in our ideas, our thoughts, our actions. And at the heart of it is that white people are superior to black, indigenous, and people of color. And that are maintaining um, systems are maintaining and defending a system of wealth and power and privilege for white people. And so white supremacy is how our country has been founded. And so when we do our work, what we're doing is looking at how is white supremacy showing up in my language, showing up in my mindset, um, because it's there. And that's why oftentimes the words we use reflect that. Connected to white supremacy is a white savior complex. It's rooted in white supremacy. Um, if white supremacy says white is right, then, then if you're not white, there's something wrong with you. There's, you're inherently flawed as a, as a BIPOC person. And so the white savior then with that notion says, well, then I need to rescue uh, black indigenous and people of color. I need to save them from this, this horrible world. Um, and it's, it's self-serving, it's harmful, again, dehumanizing. Um, and so again, white savior complex very much shows up in our language. Um, an important thing for us to be mindful of as we're doing our internal work to interrupt our own uh, bias speaking. Um, the next piece is the bootstrap mentality, right? And this is something that probably many of you have heard um, that term, pull yourself up on your, by your bootstraps is a, is a false narrative or it's, it's a myth that people reach success by themselves when we know that's not true. No one does. And yet that particular mentality is used to blame Black, Indigenous, and people of color when we start to see disproportionate rates of poverty, unemployment, home ownership, all of the ways in which racism has impacted BIPOC people. Um, there's a blame of people instead of the generational racist systems and policies that actually create those outcomes. So the bootstrap mentality has been used against us um, and, and to, keep us, um, to keep us in that box. And again, these are, these are mentalities that then show up through our language and our behavior, something that we need to interrupt. And now we're going to spend a few minutes just seeing how these examples play out in real life. Uh, one of our team members, Jessica Lawrence, spent a whole lot of time looking at foundation websites across the U.S., some maybe GFE members and some not, but we really wanted to see, given the equity focus inside the foundation community, what were these websites looking like? And so we have pulled sort of asset-based and deficit-based language 
and try to juxtapose them just to sort of bring to life what it is we're talking about. So on this next slide, I'll just read the deficit based language. Um, it says we see a part we see a partnership as a way of working together to create the opportunity for individuals to rely on their power and resources, rather than those of others to earn success. So we're looking at this as an example of bootstrap theory. And Trisha, I'd just love to hear from you sort of how you address bootstrap theory at TAF with students and faculty. Well, I think our, our kids know that um, they live and breathe this every day, right? They know that no matter how hard they work, they're still gonna be treated as less than. So what we focus on is what can you do now as a student? What kind of things can you bring to the table to support your own community, to support each other, to show them that things don't happen on their own, um, that it is a community collective and that they too can be successful um, now. They don't have to wait until they're adults. Um, and that the whole thing is not on their shoulders, right? When I look at this as a, as a grantee, what I see is um, this really isn't for me because what you're going to do is put me through um, uh, uh, the idea that I'm less than because I have to use the language in the grant that I disagree with in order to get the grant, right? So it's, it's really as for people of color who are writing to organizations that have that deficit uh, mentality, it really is a strain on our psyche and it, it's, it's hard for us to position how we really feel about who we are as people of color and our students um, if the only way we can get funding is to use that deficit language. Yeah, I certainly know when I was in that role, which it's been some time since I was at Gates, I have been guilty of that, absolutely. All the language that we use in our strategy sessions gets dumped right into our, um, our documents that get sent to our grantees without that sort of consciousness of what it's gonna feel like to be on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm so optimistic that much of this is in the process of changing, um, but I appreciate you really sharing what it's been like to be on the other side of, of the language that comes, comes in the door. Yeah. Um, on this next slide, we talk a little bit about labels and associations and the deficit based language there says yet among our children, staggering income based achievement gaps persist, especially in urban neighborhoods and rural communities. So, uh, Malia, I'd love to just talk about sometimes we have blind spots when we start to make associations between income and race and achievement and our sort of desire to make our point that we are serving the students most in need we start to aggregate these things and, um, you know, just would love to hear your counsel on that. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it goes back to problematizing, uh, to use Travian's language, and blame. And so oftentimes educators are using, um, are, are blaming students, um, our, our, our BIPOC students um, for achievement, that is actually the responsible or the outcome of poor education design, right? So many mm -hmm. people say, well, it's, it's poverty that's, that's impacting achievement when really it's about the Eurocentric curriculum that's being used or the um, policy, discipline policies that, um, that disproportionately expel and suspend our, our black and brown students. Mm -hmm. It's a lack of culturally responsive instruction. I mean, there's just multiple ways in which our systems, as Trish said earlier, are not designed for our black indigenous and, and people of color. And so it becomes an easy way for educators to find, to put the blame on something. So it must be poverty. And yet, when we look at research, even when we look at research that shows white students and black students in the same socioeconomic status, there's still gaps that show up. Mm -hmm. And so we know it's not about income. We know it's about the systems that, that have been created within in our school systems. Thank you for that. Um, and I think we just threw another question 
into the chat there, which is sort of how do we begin to unpack this word train? My word, I don't know if that'll make sense to you, but in my mind, I just think of how I sort of link all these things together because I'm just so determined to make my point. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sort of the idea of how do we start to unpack that, um, I think is something I'm certainly struggling with and would love to hear from our participants if they have found some tools and techniques. Um, the next slide you'll see, slide seven, is, is I'll just read the deficit based language again. It's an example of white saviorism. It says, working together to level the playing field for our disadvantaged youth and children. So I'll just throw this one to Trish, sort of what's going on here. So you have personally called me out for this one. I have done this <laughs> without even knowing it. I mean, these are just words that come out of my mouth and you look at me and say, stop that. And I am eternally grateful for having that sort of counsel in my life. Not everybody has that. Um, but just help us think about ways in which we can um, catch ourselves when we're going down this road. Well, I think, you know, first of all, there's, there's really no such thing as leveling the playing field. I hate that phrase because essentially what it's saying is uh, it still goes to white is best, white is right. And so now we're going to bring everybody up. Or for some white people, it says, oh, you're going to bring my kid down, right, to level the playing field. Um, for disadvantage, who is disadvantage? Who defines disadvantage? Right? When I look at these kind of words, it's like my kid, when I think about my own children and their friends, black and brown friends, they feel like the world is theirs. And then they read that they're disadvantaged. Um, they're not disadvantaged in our community. Why are they disadvantaged in the world? And then who gets the, the job of making them um, better or lifting them from that disadvantage? It's certainly the assumption is that it's not people of color, you know, adults of color who can do that. If you look at how um, are the language we're using and who gets to define the problem and who gets to define the solution, it's certainly not the people in the community who are actually experiencing the problem. So this kind of language, it, again, you know, I'll just use the word demoralizing again. It makes me feel like there that um, there is the belief that the only folks who can make this system right are white people who decide how they're going to make it right. But what they need to do is dismantle the system, the entire system, as we saw on the earlier slides. One phrase links to another, links to another. Be there to, to realize that we have a problem and stop perpetuating the problem by putting Band-Aids on that make it even worse. That probably didn't answer your question, but that's where no, I was going. I mean, there's, it did. There's so much learning in all of that. And I, you know, I... I have been so guilty so often um, of, and, and, you know, it's sort of coupled, white saviorism coupled with a lack of context, right? Like we tend to try to force our communications into 120 characters or be succinct mm -hmm. or, and so I also feel like it, it happens unconsciously as a form of shorthand and it happens consciously as just a a mindset shift that has to take place. Leah, I just want to give you an opportunity to add something to this. We've also talked about processes and procedures that need to change in order to really think about how you address this in an overt way. Um, well, I was thinking about the asset-based um, taxonomy that you have here, mm -hmm. which um, you know is, is where we want to put our efforts, right? That's where we want our energy to go is really understanding what systems in place, the kinds of oppression that live within are baked into our systems that are actually reproducing these outcomes mm -hmm. and not our youth. Um, and I personally have started to really like the word um, redesign because we know through our history that, that our systems were purposely designed to exclude black indigenous and people of color. And so if we have any chance of, of, of achieving racial equity, then we have to intentionally redesign those systems. And so we can't, we're not about fixing kids. That's not, that's not what we're doing. We are about changing systems. And so all of the ways in which we work and we speak 
is to is to focus on the system and how we change it, redesigning the system for liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and you also make a great point, which is we have we have included uh, an asset based exemplar on each of these slides, and the slides will be available as Celine mentioned after this. Uh, webinar and uh, you know in the uh, because we have an ambitious agenda we haven't been reading all of them but I just would encourage you to go back and look at uh, foundations who have just gone through um, clearly you can tell they're doing the work and they have really done a masterful job of of creating asset-based language around these different concepts I'm going to transition us to something really tactical and that's because as a communicator right now, identifying race and ethnicity feels really hard to me and it's constantly evolving. And um, I find myself not speaking up because I'm not sure I'm gonna say the right thing. And so again, this is really tactical. We're kind of going from really big conceptual mindset shifts to things that are sort of small. But I also think that things that are small are mattering a lot right now, too, because I think for so long we assumed, I assumed that people just knew my heart, that my intentions were good, and that my intentions would somehow overcome my impact. And I think, you know, over the past year, we've really started to understand that that's not no longer the case. So we put some words on the screen. Um, which is not to say that we have to transition away from these words, but really to ask the question of those of you who are participating today, like, should we? Are these the kinds of words we need to figure out how to replace? And if we need to replace them, what do we replace them with? <laughs> um, because I don't think we necessarily know that. And so, um, you know, what are some of the questions we should be asking ourselves when communicating about race? Black with a capital B. But when, then when you add black and brown, are there people who feel invisible in that? Um, Hispanic, Latinx, Asian. You know, I think we are um, really unsure of how we tackle some of these things. So I just love to throw to both Malia and Trish on this. And, you know, um, Trish, if you wouldn't mind just kicking us off on just how we should be thinking about these terms. Um, when I look at these terms, the first thing that comes to my mind is poverty pimp. Mm. That was not on our list. <laughs> it was not, but no. this, this is poverty pimping. When I see language like this, um, I, I recall um, I was asked to, um, to describe um, a situation where um, we got our students at, we broke the cycle of poverty with one of our graduates. And to present that, it's like, no, we're not here to, to pimp poverty here. What we're here to do is to make sure kids have a future and they understand what their worth is and that they can create a world that they envision, right? And, mm -hmm. and none of this says that right here. And us putting them in front of people to say, oh, look what Taft did for me um, is not right. They need to say it in their own words what they got out of the situation, not us setting them up as, oh, look who we saved. But that is that mentality when I look at all these words, it's, oh, look how good we are. We saved the poor little black and brown kids. And we need to move away from this kind of language. And there are lots of other words you can use. We, you know, there are examples that were given in this, um, this presentation. There are a lot of ways to, to um, present the idea that you're trying to make things better. But you know, maybe partnering with organizations led by people of color could be a good idea. And sit down with them and listen and learn and then find a partner who might be willing to, um, and you will pay them to do this, that might be willing to sit with you and help craft what it is you wanna say and then help you move to actually changing your behavior to match those words. And Trish, we know that the, the foundations represented on this call, you know, are, are actually doing this work. I mean, there is a real commitment to investing much more deeply in organizations that are black and brown. That's a, there's a real awareness that there, there are huge issues there. And I just appreciate your candor, like throwing that out there, because it is something that I know we're all talking about. Um, 
I, I think I want to just take us since it's 1140 and I do want to be able to talk to talk a little bit about the chat. I would just ask that, you know, if there are other words you would add to this list, you know, we would love to compile a list um, based on this conversation today. So if you could just identify other words you think that we as a sector need to really be figuring out how to transition and replace, um, add those in so that we can create a more exhaustive list. But I'm going to take us to the next slide, which is four questions we can ask ourselves. Um, we did not copy this from a Harvard manual. This is the struggle of the four of us on a phone call, including our um, colleague Jess, and really trying to think through almost um, the example I used with them was, you know, I kind of live on a diet, me and Oprah. And um, when I'm on a diet, depending on what it is, it creates a new level of consciousness for me if I'm you know, on a keto diet, I can't have this, that, and the other. So I really have to think about it. And can I have that? Can I do that? And so I want to have that same level of rigor around, can I say that, right? It, it, am I okay to say this? And so what are some things that will stop me in my tracks before I actually start to communicate? So there is nothing genius about these four questions, but, and I know that the group assembled can help make them better, but here are the ones that we came up with. And I'd just love to go through these briefly. And um, Malia, I just, would you take questions one and two? I think they're sort of interconnected and I uh, think that's where we wanna start. Sure, yes, thank you, Cindy. Yeah, I mean, I love these self-reflection questions. Um, I think I said earlier that so much of the work around anti-racism is, is, is a, a both and, it's about, changing systems and also our constant internal work that we're doing around our own mindsets, our own bias, um, the own ways in which we've been um, impacted by white supremacy. And so in order to interrupt that bias and, and that way, that conditioning, we have to get into the practice of asking ourselves questions. Um, and, and so I like this first one is before I say what I'm about to say, where am I putting the blame? Am I putting the blame on our BIPOC students or am I actually shifting to the system? Again, we're about fixing systems, changing systems. We are not about fixing kids. And yet our language reinforces that often. So really being mindful about what I'm about to say, where am I, where am I putting the blame? Does the blame go um, assigned to the right place? Um, and I think Trabian said this in his video earlier about who is the subject of this sentence? Again, is it the student or the system? Mm -hmm. And who are we shining a light on? Again, going back to what I, what I said, we're about changing systems. Um, and so we need to make sure we're shining a light on the aspects of the system that we have agency to change um, and being active in that. Um, and so really asking yourself, um, it requires a pause going inside and really being mindful about what are what am I bringing forward? What, what mentality is coming up for me that I might need to interrupt before I, I speak or before I'm writing my grant? Thank you for that. Um, this third question, I actually want to uh, ask Jesse to just pull up this next slide. Uh, intentions versus impact. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I think my colleague, Bib Hubbard, is on the phone. She's the president of Learning Heroes. And they have done a lot of research around how what we say makes parents feel. <laughs> and, that, and that what we hear is, what we say is not what they hear. And so in this slide, you know, all of us, uh, I shouldn't say all of us, that's a huge assumption. Many of us were involved in the disaggregation of data as one of the huge equity victories over the last couple of decades. And I think, um, we are really proud of that and, the, and its ability to impact decision-making. I think the unintended consequence of that work was how the, the, the reporting of subgroup data made black and brown families feel. And so when Learning Heroes went into the field to talk to parents about their expectations around school and their use of data, what came up organically was this idea that the subgroup data being reported, whether that was in a school report or it was in a school accountability report, made them feel discriminated against and categorized and shamed and stereotyped. 
And I remember the first time we heard this, we were literally heartbroken because um, because it hadn't been aware, to, it had to be brought up, right? That it wasn't something that just immediately um, was known to us. And so we've had this consciousness now for a while and have been working actively on it. But I just wanted to give a really concrete example of a place where I know I've been complicit in this language in a way that's been really hurtful. And I think part of the work going forward for all of us in the foundation community is to really think about that. Where have we been a part of something where the work we felt was righteous, but maybe the communications out of the work um, started to codify this deficit-based language and was unintentionally hurtful. So that is, that is my question three, which is sort of the un un unintended consequence of the words that we say. Um, Trish, I'd love for you to take this fourth one, which is, you know, around celebrating, elevating, or marginalizing. Yeah, so, you know, I, I prefer to, um, to talk about possibilities, right, versus problems. Often in grant applications, what problem are you trying to solve? Instead of what opportunity are you trying to bring to your um, constituents, whoever they may be? Uh, what kind of change are you trying to make or what kind of um, opportunities are you trying to create? Um, staying on that vein, and then you could talk about what gets in the way of being able to do that. That's actually the problem, right? The problem is what gets in the way of me being able to create possibilities for um, my community. And if we can stay on that, if the language could stay in that frame, I think that a lot of richness will come out of, um, of the language that grantees use, as well as grantors will get a better appreciation and understanding of what is actually going on in communities and how communities see themselves versus um, you know, hiring a consultant who doesn't look anything like the community that you're looking at, coming back and giving you ideas about um, how to frame uh, the opportunity that you're putting in front of, of uh, organizations to apply for. So um, I know that's hard for some folks because you always want to be solving a problem, but you know, we need to get to that place where we're talking, just talking about opportunity and the problem are the problems are the roadblocks that keep us from those opportunities. Thank you for that. Um, I just before I, I asked both Malia and Trish to make some closing remarks. It is such a great opportunity for them and for us to be able to just speak candidly about this work. We don't have a lot of spaces in which we get to do that. But before uh, I call on them, I just want to ask you uh, in the audience to, to put your questions in the chat. We're going to have a few minutes to really dig into a couple of these things. I know we maybe haven't been as action oriented as maybe you would have liked. And I've seen that from some of the the comments. And so I just, anything that you would love for us to address while we have our two experts here would really appreciate you putting that in. Um, but as we think about closing up this conversation, I just would ask both Malia and Trish, you know, what is your advice moving forward? We are conscious now. We do have to be accountable for what we know. We have done a lot of reading, which we know is the easy part, but now we actually know better. And so, you know, if, if you could give us some, some real advice, what would it be? Well, you know, first I would say this is a journey. This is not a transaction. You don't get to, do, to learn something, boom, you're done. This is a, absolutely a journey. And you have to give yourself grace along the way, but not so much grace that you stop the work. Um, the other thing is to read, please, Proximity matters. Get yourself in front of, amongst, around people of color so that you can understand us. You know, I feel like you're working in a silo for the most part, trying to do good and trying to change, but there's no real reference point other than the research that was done by researchers who don't look like me. So be proximate to the people and the work. And I think this will go a lot smoother 
And um, I know Malia is going to talk about um, being uncomfortable, and I'll just reiterate as well. You know, being uncomfortable means that you're breaking through and you're really doing something. Don't stop. Don't stop. Malia, jump in here. Yeah, thank you, Trish. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, wow. Um, yeah, a couple things come to mind is, um, this might seem like a tangent, but when I first started my business, I struggled with what I was gonna name it. And I, my business is called Becoming Justice. And people gave me pushback. Well, don't you mean being justice? You can't, you can't make your business a process becoming. And I was like, well, yes, I can, because I believe that we are all in our becoming work around justice. And becoming to me means that we are constantly doing our own internal work around our biases and our stereotypes that we hold um, to, to be able to show up differently, right? To be able to lead in a way that's actually going to lead to liberation from, from racism in our education system. So that's one of the pieces, um, and again, around the discomfort, whenever you're in, in a becoming mode, of course it's uncomfortable. And yet uncomfortable is a reminder that we're actually doing the right, we're on the right track, right? That we're, we're, we're beginning to, to have breakthroughs, we're beginning to push back um, against our conditioning. Um, and so I, I, I echo what Trish said is, is stay in that process and just accept that you're gonna make mistakes. It's just inevitable. If you're gonna make the mistakes, and I would say we all need to get really good at repairing harm. How do I own and acknowledge when I make a mistake? How do I work to repair relationships? I don't think we spend enough time um, doing that. So really spending time there. Um, and then the last thing that just popped into my head is, is this beautiful quote that an educator recently shared with me. She was leading some work around racial equity and she had a parent um, of color in the room um, who was just, you know, again, heart stricken over the words that we were, that, that, that they were using to describe her children. And she said, and she challenged everyone in the room to say, to think, why can't you just meet us where we dream? And that just always resonated with me. And, and I think, I think what Trish said about the possibilities made me think about that. It's like, yeah, meet us where we dream, where we want to go. Don't, don't, continue to, to push your stereotypes and your dehumanizing um, beliefs on us. So, so meet us where, where we dream. That's sort of amazing. I would actually love to end on that incredible high note, except we've gotten a really good question. <laughs> so I actually am going to read it really quick to give you guys a minute to think, to reflect, because I really appreciate the the being transparent here about the struggle. So we hear from one of our guests, I have heard this and personally struggle with deciding what I think about it. Some would say that suggesting that black and brown people need white people to evaluate and come to terms with the realities of their whiteness and privilege is an encouragement to maintain the white savior complex. Some also suggest that labeling white people as supreme encourages black and brown people to have a deficit mindset. How do we respond to these ideas and how do they relate to aiming for asset-based language? Malia, I'm throwing this one over to you. <laughs> this is your expertise. Wow, thanks Trish. And I'm over here like processing because that is a great question and I'm, I'm processing it. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, so the first thing that comes up is the second half of that. So. Um, some also suggest that labeling white people as supreme encourages black and brown people to have a deficit mindset. Um, so I learned also the hard way as a, as a, as a, as a teacher and a, a leader in this work that um, if we don't start with history and helping really under, people understand how our history was constructed by and rooted in white settler colonialism and how that history then has been meant maintained and held um, by white people at the exclusion of BIPOC, right? That we, we as black indigenous and people of color didn't get to shape this country. We didn't get to create the laws and the, and the, 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 the laws and the, the, the way our, the hierarchy, right? That was, that was pushed upon us. And so, 
I think when you lay out history and you and you help people understand what history has how history has shaped and shaped us when we say the word supreme or superior it doesn't it has context that it is rooted in white settler colonialism white people are not supreme it has been dictated by white people who have set this country up that that that's where they sit and so for us to get really clear about our history um, and how our history has set up this, this horrible sort of racial hierarchy is what's important so that we can start to bust that or break that, that deficit um, mindset. Um, and so that's one thing that comes to me uh, when I read that question is really, it's like, no, white people are not supreme by any stretch. Um, they have made themselves supreme and maintained that over his, history. And that is indeed the problem. And so we need to shed light on the history that many of us didn't receive in school. So that's one thing that was coming up for me um, in answering that question. Yeah, I agree, like Malia. I was just gonna add real quickly that, um, and then we live it every day um, subconsciously. When we look at our media, when we look at our schools, when we look at everything that is held as beautiful, you know, very simply going to Google and type in beautiful, it's all white people. Type mm -hmm. in smart, it's all white and Asian people, right? But mostly white people and mostly white guys, right? And so it's not so much that, that we as people of color are saying white people are supreme. And I don't even know if there are many white people who use white supremacy or supreme to describe themselves. It's just baked in. It's baked in from history. Everybody has to compare to you. And if they can't compare to you, then they're no good. And that that's kind of, you know, the crux of this whole thing, that people of color are always being compared to white people. And um, as if white people own the, um, and earned and own the language of being supreme and being the best, which is furthest from the case. And that's the stuff that's the hardest for people to grapple with, I think. Um, and so whoever asked that question, I, I think, um, it, um, I think you know what the answer is. So I'm glad you asked the question because I think it helps inform other people. I totally agree. And I just, before I pass it back to Celine, um, we're at the end of our hour. This is the beginning. <laughs> we didn't solve anything, but I do think we surfaced a lot of really good counsel. And I just owe a real debt of gratitude to Trish and to Malia for their candor. This is not an easy conversation to have and it's a hard format in which to have it on a screen and not being able to see the other attendees. And um, I think we've really seen your heart for the work today. And I just wanna honor that and just say, I'm, I'm so grateful that you were willing to join us. You know, you both have said this work is most easily done in relationship. And I am actually really grateful to be in a relationship with, with both of you. So thank you. Uh, Celine, I'm going to kick it back to you for next steps and next programming for GFE. Yeah, great, great. Um, well, thank you all for joining. We had great attendance, which means that Cindy and Trish and Malia, uh, you are really what our members are looking for. And so I really appreciate the conversation. Um, we will start and end with saying that this is not over. This is a journey. Um, we as an organization, you know, we may take this conversation, this specific conversation further. It seems like there's interest. Uh, we are also starting uh, on April 14th, three times in April, having some focus groups on, you know, where should Grantmakers for Education go with our members on the topic of racial justice. And so we invite you to be a part of those. Um, those are formative conversations. They're done with par our partners at the Equity Lab. And, uh, you know, and we have a, a variety of programs coming up over the next few weeks. And so you can see those on the screen. And we thank you all for coming today and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you to our great panelists. This was fantastic. Have a great day. Bye-bye.